recording has started. Great. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. I hope everyone's quarantines are doing well. Um, hope everyone is safe um, and healthy. Um, so first off, uh, before I get, I, um, just to like preface that we are recording this meeting. So if you need to dip out at any point, um, we'll be posting it hopefully on the Facebook uh, Facebook page. Um, and so you can reference back to it or just send it to friends if need be. Um, but I wanted to start off by uh, giving a brief introduction of Professor Reddy and Soham, who will be moderating today. Um, and yeah, so I'll just start off with that. Um, so Professor Reddy is an associate professor in the department, departments of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies and the Comparative History of Ideas at the University of Washington. Um, there he teaches courses on racial capitalism, settler and overseas colonialism, sexuality, and U.S. modernity. Um, he is a co-editor of the social text special issue, Econo Economies of Dispossession, Indigeneity, Race, and, Cap and Capitalism, um, which address addresses the ways financialization, debt, and expropri expropriation work today through social relations already configured and disposed by Imperial Conquest and Racial Capitalism. Um, his book, which was published in 2011, uh, Freedom with Violence, Race, Sexuality in the US State, analyzes how the nation states claim to provide freedom from violence depends on a systematic, systematic deployment of violence against peoples perceived as non-normative and irrational. Um, and yeah, so we are really grateful to have uh, Professor Reddy here with us today, um, talk about his work and his, uh, kind of journey through academics. Um, and moderating this discussion today again uh, will be Soham Pao, who is a co-head at the Asian American Culture Center and a senior in the BAMA program in history. Um, Soham's senior thesis, which is also online, <laughs> I would definitely recommend, um, explore the ways in which mortgaging of the enslaved, uh, mortgaging of the enslaved continues to influence present day forms of financial capitalism. Um, and yeah, I can maybe hand it off to Soam to give us like a roadmap of what we'll be talking about. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, what was I going to say? I don't remember. Um, oh, I, I guess just that uh, I also am really grateful to Queer and Asian for um, co-hosting this event. Um, and we have like many generations of Q&A here, um, including generations of... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I'm really grateful for the sort of generational support. Um, so I guess uh, we, what I was thinking is, I think we have maybe maybe a few too many people to do individual introductions um, all at, for everyone, but um, some of the things that I thought we would talk about are uh, Professor Reddy's sort of trajectory, um, his work in Freedom with Violence, which um, is from Duke Press. I just finished reading it last night. It's really, really good. I really recommend it. Um, and then also just sort of the things that Professor Reddy has been doing at Yale for the last sort of semester and a half, um, and just like in New Haven broadly. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we start? Okay. Um, and we'll try to keep it conversational. So I might ask just a few sort of um, introductory questions, and then I'm hoping that we'll be able to do uh, sort of a conversation afterwards. Um, let me just pull up my little so list. Hum, while, while you're doing that, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, I know we can't do uh, introductions because there might be too many folks, but I'd love to get a sense um, if just a few people um, or six or seven people wanted to sort of say um, sort of what what they're hoping to talk about today or what they're thinking about as they as they logged on to to this conversation just to get a sense of where people are at you can also just say I was bored at home <laughs> um. I guess I could say something. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a very valid reason. I, I think I am just born at home, but I think 
some people are are not bored at home as in like mm. um like like I feel like especially right now like women gender sexuality studies are so important because um like every single day when I look in the news there's a lot of like increases in like domestic violence cases mm-hmm. especially against women like all over the world due to all the like side effects of like the global stay-at-home orders so it's really I just really want to know more about the topic uh, because it's, I feel like it's especially salient right now Well, maybe we can we can start, and folks could um, contribute in the Q and A section. And actually, Elijah, if you don't, if can, if you can uh, enable the chat, maybe people can also just like type in questions um, if they have those. That could be really helpful, um, especially if they're in a place where audio is kind of iffy. Um, but maybe. If I can start a question, um, Professor Reddy, I guess I was just wondering if you could sort of narrate a little bit like where you got your start, um, sort of if this is something that has followed you through undergrad, sort of uh, thinking about like gender, sexuality, um, political economy, um, or just sort of like how how those things have sort of uh, come together for you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really interesting. I was thinking about this. Um, Sohan sent me this question a few days ago, and um, I was thinking about it um, and looking back, and I'm going to actually give like years, which will date how old I am. So um, this is like a total confession. Um, I when I came, uh, I would I I was born in India and and um, came to the U.S. when I was very young. Then I went back to India um, for middle schooling, and then I came back to the U.S. for high school. Um, and when I came back, which was um, 1984, um, I remember very markedly, um, uh, you know, sitting in my parents' living room in, um, which at that time was my living room too. Um, uh, watching the news, watching um, Peter Jennings. Um, uh, on ABC um, and seeing uh, these protests that were happening in San Francisco and in New York um, that were about people with HIV and AIDS. Um, And I didn't really understand the protests. Um, I just saw uh, that there was a tremendous disruption to society or to those societies, those, those places of the city. Um, what, what I probably was seeing was them filming an ACT UP die-in, but I didn't know that it was ACT UP and I didn't know um, that they were doing die-ins. Um, and, um, and, you know, it was all framed with an extremely homophobic discourse about HIV being a, um, a, a gay disease. Um, and what was really interesting for me was um, that who I saw on the screen were white people, um, white gay men um, and, and white women. Um, and they, you know, they would say words like homosexuality. Um, no one really said gay um, that was on the national media or queer. They, they used this really clinical word of homosexuality. Um, and what I realized was I'm not those people, but there's something they're doing that matters to me. Um, that there was some connection I had with them um, in terms of what they were demanding and doing and fighting for that spoke to me, um, even if who I was uh, wasn't on that screen. Um, and that kind of, that has been a kind of defining um, entrance into um, sort of U.S. society and U.S. politics for me. Um, I, ca- I went to UCSD as an undergraduate, um, and it was a it was a period of tremendous um, political liveliness among undergraduate students. Um, I was at UCSD in 1990, um, when the year that I started was the year of the first Gulf War. Um, with the invade, with uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and George Bush, the older Bush, 
um, uh, invading uh, uh, Iraq um, and <clears throat> occupying it. So there was so there was an instantaneous um, anti-war movement on campus as well as an anti-imperial conversation that was happening in my first year. Um, and then um, and I felt again very connected to it, even though the imperialism they were talking about was U.S. empire and nobody was talking about British imperialism. And I didn't know how to fit my history into that story. Like here are all these people talking about empire, but I didn't know how I related to it um, because of coming from British imperialism and its legacy. Um, but I knew that there was a connection there that I needed to learn. Um, and I had some kind of affinity with that conversation. Um, and then uh, in 92, so that was my sophomore year, was the year of the LA uprising. Um, that was the result of the acquittal of uh, the police officers who beat Rodney King. Um, and of course, the LA uprising was a um, highly racialized um, event in the media, pitting um, uh, Korean immigrant uh, people against African American people um, in the uh, inner cities of Los Angeles. Um, and students who were protesting um, were, were really protesting on the side of um, uh, African-American people and people of, of central Los Angeles um, demanding racial justice. The, the, my favorite um, uh, kind of tagline from that period was uh, the phrase, no justice, no peace. Um, and you know, people would just chant that throughout campus um, and at different kinds of organizing. Um, and, and what was developing, so that was, so that was 92. Um, right after that in 93 was Prop 187, which was California's um, proposition that uh, made um, uh, it, it unlawful to provide uh, social services and um, welfare um, entitlements to undocumented people. So it made it unlawful to give them housing, it made it unlawful to allow undocumented people to access um, hospitals, it made it unlawful for them to have Medicare, et cetera. Um, and the, the media rollout of the, of the Pro 187 group um, used the figure of uh, Latina women in particular. So immigrant women, um, who were figured as deliberately using their reproductive capacity to create um, anchor babies in the United States. Um, and so they be, it, was, it was through targeting um, uh, Latina immigrant women and their sexuality that 187 was able to um, uh, pass. So, so it, was a, it was a period you know, for student organizing where every year, um, what it meant to do anti-racist politics shifted. Um, and you had to attend to whatever was, um, you know, this is what Stuart Hall calls um, a structure and dominance, that there is at a particular moment in time, one, one structure that comes into focus um, for the members of society, but that structure is just the dominant structure and it's it's being held up by, and it's and it's um, and its power comes not from the dot from itself, but from all the other structures that it's connected to. So something like 187 anti um, sort of uh, immigrant women's uh, reproductive bodies being the source of the um, of the state's racism um, was the structure and dominance at that moment but it was connected to what was happening to the capitalist structure at the time in the transformation of um, what was now, at that time we didn't have the word, but what was now neoliberalism. And it was connected to what was happening to um, the structure of uh, gender and sexuality at the time, which had a lot to do with how um, the uh, counter hegemonic movements around HIV AIDS and women of color movements in California were being addressed and um, in different ways the attempts to neutralize them by state legislation and, um, and law and incorporation. So there's all these structures coming together and at, at one time or another a particular structure is dominant. Um, so, so for example right now we could think about um, the coronavirus and COVID-19 um, and the, um, the revelation of the um, uh, higher vulnerability of 
of Black and Latino communities as essential workers, frontline workers, um, uh, uh, as, as well as people who live in more dense um, neighborhoods and intergenerational family homes, where you have stronger family transmission, um, as 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 the as one structure in dominance right now, um, for how we think about uh, uh, the ways in which the racial structure is coming up um, at a particular moment. But at the time that I was a student, um, those were those three things that I told you were just like an example of how much every year what the structure and dominance was, was changing. And so what it meant to be part of an anti-racist community, but also what it meant to be a student of color studying race, was to think about the connections um, and linkages between these um, histories and these movements, um, um, between these forms of power and domination, um, not as being equivalent, but being highly distinct, but connected. Um, and that was the kind of milieu that I was trained in um, I was trained at UCSD when, um, you know, its ethnic studies department, which was created um, just a couple, a few years before I arrived, um, was one of the first uh, ethnic studies departments in the, in the country, um, not to organize itself by racial groups. So it wasn't like you studied African Americans or Asian Americans or Latinos or indigenous people, but rather it was organized as a comparative ethnic studies driven by inquiry. So you might ask about race and state power and um, popular music. And that class might be um, uh, heavily African-American one quarter, but might become African-American and Latino hip hop the next quarter. So, um, so we were, so that was the kind of milieu that I, I um, kind of was trained in as an undergrad. And the last thing I'll say, I know I'm t talking a lot about this uh, uh, biography, but uh, hopefully it'll give us stuff to talk about in terms of your guys' histories as a comparison point, is that um, the, the queer of color, so the, so the queer group on campus, uh, the LGBT, it was called the LGBT group at that time. Um, we were, I joined my freshman year, my first year, um, and uh, we were mostly students of color. Um, and that was really interesting already to me. So, so even though it was just called LGBT, when you looked at who was in it, it was mostly students of color. And that was because most of us had very little to lose, to be really honest, right? Like a lot of the um, middle class students um, who, some of them, for example, you know, who had family at, in San Diego region, um, people who are still close to their families, um, people, you know, people who had all kinds of monetary ties. It was just really different for the group of, of students of color, um, all, almost all of whom were on financial aid um, and, um, and really were uh, mobilized around um, queer politics. And so um, what was great about the group was that it was a lot like the women of color group on campus. There was, there was a separate women of color group, even though there was some overlap. In the in who joined which groups, um, but it was a it was a kind of queer of color group, and that's actually where I started thinking of queer of color work. Um, so you know we we there wasn't anyone that was a particular. Uh, it wasn't like we was a white dominant group with a people of color minority. It was it was queer of color from the start, um, and that really informed um, the way that I think about um, queer studies and queer politics. Um, and, and what queer itself could mean. Um, and we can talk about that a little later, but that was the kind of milieu that I started um, uh, as a student. And that took me to the questions that I asked as a graduate student. That's really helpful, I think. Um, I think something that's interesting is at Yale, um, because I think also just Yale's history is is so, white and wealthy um the yeah, victoria is like headbanging um <laughs> i uh i know professor i mean i took a course with professor chauncey who was at yale during the sort of um 80s 70s and 80s more um and he has sort of told us about how the, the lgbtq co-op was essentially a white group mm -hmm. um and i mean we can even think about sort of the there were, I think, like 12 Asian students at Yale in like the seven, in like the 1971 um, 
and so it's just like a really different history but I think it's like a really rich history that informs how Q&A has sort of come up I actually don't even know when it was founded um because it predates my time which is good um it was happened. founded in 2013. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, can, I, can I ask what it was founded for? Like what, what people wanted out of it when they when they founded it? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Adrian. I'm I'm uh, visibly unkempt, so I have my video off, but uh, <laughs> I'm Adrian, I use they them pronouns. I graduated in 2017. Um the so I, so I was a freshman in 2013 to 14, and in the spring of 2014, a group of seniors asked me, hey, do you want to join this group that we made? It's called Queer and Asian, but we're all seniors. So I said, okay. Then I ended up kind of being a part of that for my all my sophomore and junior years before handing it off as a senior. But the main concern that they had was essentially that so at that point, there are there already existed um, De Colores, which was the Latinx queer group. And then at the time, there was um, a group called PRISM, which was mm -hmm. meant to be the African-American queer group. PRISM was the kind of the OG um, queer of color group at Yale. And they formed because they felt that co-op you know, was really too white and that they were just fundamentally unwelcome in that space especially because, so, I mean, at Yale, you, know, you know, we have the ACC, the AFM house at La Casa, and they felt that the co-op was just not committed to coordinating with the AFM house or with African-American students at all as to their, you know, finding itself, even though a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of really major queer movements and organizing in the U.S. has been, you know, centered around and promoted with or sorry, by the African American community in the first place. So PRISM formed, but then, so then Q&A was kind of the last to join the phrase. So the Native American Cultural Center has had this reputation of being very queer friendly in the first place. So they don't particularly have their own group, but um, in 2014, Q&A was kind of passed on to me. At the same time, PRISM disappeared. And so the Afghan House was left without a kind of functioning for queers of color group for their house for a while. But, um, and then they kind of came back with Queer Caucus in like 2015, 2016, that kind of fell apart too. There was like um, this interesting watershed-ish, not really moment in 2016, mm -hmm. sorry, 2015, the fall of 2015, there was a lot of, you know, big protests at Hio around race and then later around you know gender and sexuality and organizing and all of that and there was this weird takeover quote unquote takeover of the co-op with a you know board of students that were all students of color ostensibly but nothing really happened with that the students didn't really reach out to q a or to the colores or um, queer caucus they were so the board of co-op was filled with students of color, but there was no active organizing around, you know, around, you know, celebrating queer of color identity. So then that kind of disappeared by my, by 2017. So I think the general consensus, at least when I was there, it was that, okay, co-op is a white space and there doesn't seem to be very much we can do about it. And then that's why these little other groups formed. I think that still holds true. Um as like a reputation. Um, we had like a recent forum that I didn't organize. So maybe Victoria has more thoughts on it than I do. But um, my main takeaway was like, it seems like we're not really committed to having either the co-op, which is our sort of like umbrella LGBTQ group, or the office, which is our institutional LGBTQ organization, sort of supporting, trying to support us. But I, I don't know if Victoria has more to say. Yeah, I think that's generally true. And like, I see that in like how they hire PLs as well. Um, I'm not going to bring my personal beef into this because I have a lot to say in that regard that I just shouldn't bring up <laughs> in this space. But um, there's like a general, I don't know, disengagement with the cultural centers when like the co-op or the office are like 
doing any type of advocacy work or just like anything in general there's like mm -hmm. this sort of disregard like both on part of like the faculty running the spaces and also the students that's very interesting that's very helpful um you know give me a sense of where you all are coming from i mean one thing that makes me think about is something that um we had talked about a little bit this morning for us already about like institutionalization and what that mm -hmm. does is like um you know you have like the co-op becoming institutionalized and you also have the cultural centers becoming institutionalized um and how that has sort of created like a siphon like a, a siloing i guess mm -hmm. of, of interests um such that you know if it has anything to do with race you <laughs> You go to a cultural center and you talk about it there and um if it has anything it, even if you're queer um whereas white students ostensibly don't have like a cultural center space so they can sort of go less around the co-op yeah um so that's not something that makes me think about yeah no i think that's right i mean so there's a history to that and i think that's kind of uh, some of the work that I was trying to do in, um, in Freedom with Violence, for example, is to understand um, what was the history that made white uh, gays and lesbians think about themselves as a culture or a ethnicity akin to um, the way that African Americans or Asian Americans or Latinos or indigenous people um, were figured as um, uh, each um, you know, part of a different cultural center. Um, you know, what was, how did that come about? Um, and what does it mean to participate in it, right? Um, now, I think the question about institutionalization is important, which is sometimes you have to participate in it because there's no, you just arrive to campus and this is the way things are set up and this is the way resources are distributed and these are the ways that you find friends and these are the ways that you um, find the topics you're interested in. Um, but so so you can't always you know uh, just walk away from the way something is set up but you can be really always actively thinking about what the setup is not allowing you to think through um, what the setup is organizing you to think about um, and how and how it's organizing you to think about yourself um, and and i think that that's what a lot of these um different centers do is that they're 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 trying they're kinds of setups for to tell you how to think about your social difference oftentimes in ways that neutralize questions of power um, uh, and neutralize questions of the of the history of of, of power in of the institution in relationship to these communities um, and i think they also try to transform the question of race and the question of sexuality and gender, um, but, but especially race and sexuality like queerness, um, into cultural difference so that there isn't the question of what does this mean epistemologically? What is the intellectual questions that we need to be asking? What kind of education should I be getting at Yale um, if um, uh, Yale says that it's committed to these forms of social difference um, and that that those questions shouldn't just be relegated to ERNM or African American studies or queer studies those are questions that should be transforming history they should be transforming your general requirements they should be transforming English etc right so I so Soham and I talked a little about this as the paradox of how things get institutionalized and what effects um, they have on, um, on, on sort of students of color and on movements for social justice, um, which I think is the more important way to frame this, or, um, or movements for sexual justice or racial justice or for indigenous sovereignty, however you wanna think about it. Um, uh, I think the question to ask is, how does the structure in which the university is approaching social differences impact um, whether and how and, and whether you're thinking about those identities in relationship to movements for social transformation. Yeah, something interesting I kind of would like to point out on that note actually about thinking about the way we're framing these issues as individuals, as communities, also as, you know, through the medium of the institution. I think it's interesting that 
the language that we're using even right now, we're, you know, using the terms like people of color, queer students of color, but actually, you know, in Q&A and in, you know, in the AACC and in a lot of cultural houses, a lot of students don't identify as students of color, but still, you know, would like to draw on these resources and these communities. So what does that mean when we're kind of trying to navigate, you know, these even like within a group that seem to be very homogenous by these outside forces of the co-op or the university or whatever when you have students who say you know i'm not a person of color but i do identify with this community you know i guess how are we meant to vouch for ourselves in that case to these outside people who have put us all in this little bubble together well i would um I would I would change that a little bit, which is, I think that it's really important to make um, spaces for people who say, I'm not um, a, a member of, um, and I don't have the historical experience of somebody with this form of social difference, but I am committed to the political work that you all are doing um, uh, as uh, someone who's implicated in the social regime or social structures um, that you're trying to fight. So, but that means that we would have to um, vocalize ourselves what, what the relationship is between our cultural affinity group and our um, political, social, intellectual project. Um, otherwise, people will say things like, you know, I'm not a member of your group, but I identify with you. And you don't, we don't want that. You know, we, what does that even mean to identify with somebody, right? What we want them to say is, I identify with the issues that you're concerned about, even though um, I know I am differently positioned in those, in those issues. Um, so I think that that's one of the challenges of undergrad affinity groups is figuring out how to both be a place for people to gather and really, um, you know, have a, have a place to just let your hair down when you're in such a white dominant institution. Um, and then also uh, try to come together and think about what kind of project around race you're trying to build. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we can learn from the long history of African American student organizations, um, you know, in colleges, which goes all the way back to the 1900s, um, is that they've been able to do both things. They've been able to both be a place where you can let your hair down and um, have a place where you're not, you know, surrounded by um, people asking stupid questions or, or you know, um, thinking of themselves as more important in a room than anybody else and so on and so forth. Um, but also they could articulate what they were invested in politically, intellectually, and socially um, uh, such that if people wanted to join around those uh, projects or, or concerns, they made space for that as well in a very different way. So we could, you know, I was saying to Soham, we could think about what, what kind of project Q&A would like to take up or be um, uh, a, uh, a voice for. Um, and again, like I was saying about my undergrad, it can change from year to year. Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a single project because there's no single identity um, that is the source of, of what Q&A is supposed to be about. One thing that makes me think of um, is, I mean, there's a lot of sort of discourse, I think, that's come out around coronavirus. Um, and actually, I'm quite sure that the faculty, um, certain faculty members have, at Yale have been sort of implicated in this, but around sort of, we reject um, sort of like hate crimes against Asians. Mm. Um, and I, I, have, I mean, personally, I've always kind of bristled at that. Um, because I think it gets back to this thing of like, well, are you against it because you're worried about how that might impact you? Or is it, are you against it because you're against hate crimes as a whole? Mm -hmm. um, you're against that kind of like violence um, mm -hmm. being wielded, whether it's racial, against like a sexual racial gender minority. Um, I wonder, for, for one of the things I, I was thinking about too, I think relatedly is when we say queer and Asian, or I, I was part of queer and Asian, are we thinking of queer as like 
a descriptor of identity um, in like a very, in like a cultural sense, as you said, mm -hmm. um, or are we thinking about it as like a description of one's position mm -hmm. in society as like a sort of position of power and disempowerment. Um, and same with Asian, I think. I think that like a racial category can't be sort of relegated to the realm of the cultural. Um, mm -hmm. Asian especially, I think, is one of those categories that really defies um, such a cultural organization. Um, so maybe we can think about it differently beyond sort of that cultural narrative. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that, you, that you're bringing up that I think is really important um, and was, was a big part of, of how I learned about race uh, was that, you know, and I think the coronavirus really makes this so explicit, which is that you can't separate races, race from the history um, of capitalism, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, in my own work, uh, I think I've shifted to really thinking more, not about ethnic studies, but about racial capitalism um, mm -hmm. and how the work in ethnic studies has been um, in different ways an investigation um, both of racial capitalism's uh, different modes of operation and violence, and also an investigation of the occluded histories um, mm -hmm. of racial capitalism, you know, African American histories, histories of interracial connection, histories of queer sexualities, et cetera. Um, but, but I think that, you know, the coronavirus and COVID-19 ma make bear so, so explicitly that, that this is always really the class system and the class structure that is racially articulated and inflected that we're, we're dealing with and working with. Um, and so it's hard to think about race without having to think about what's happening ec economically in society um, and what's happening in the division of labor and how race is operating there. Um, so I think that, you know, that said, one of the things that's really, really interesting about um, Asian American studies, and particularly about the, the place where Asian American studies and queer studies intersect, um, is really around the long history of anti-Asian um, and particularly anti-Chinese racism that has figured um, uh, Chinese bodies migrating to the U.S. or in the U.S. as vectors of disease. So um, the you know a great 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 book on this that everyone should read is Nayan Shah's Contagious Divides. Um, and Contagious Divides begins by looking at the invention of public health, modern public health as an apparatus, um, as, a, as a institution in the United States um, in the 1870s. Um, and in, in the West Coast, different than the East Coast, but in the West Coast, public health's invention and, um, and uh, expansion uh, into uh, not just society, but into the state came from its promise to regulate Chinese depravity and Chinese um, uh, bodies as vectors of smallpox, tuberculosis, cholera, and other communicable diseases. Um, and so the invention of public health as, a, as, an, as an institution, as a legitimate apparatus of knowledge, and as a um, a, a discipline that had authority, so much authority that it could make people in a society behave in particular ways, that whole, that, that kind of power came from the racial regulation of Chinese uh, immigrants in San Francisco from the 1870s to the 1900s. Um, and, and so at this moment of coronavirus, we're seeing a, a repetition of tropes that have been at the very core of American conceptions of public health, um, which is that um, we need to sequester and quarantine Chinese migration from our lands and that will protect us. And of course, that idiocy is what has gotten us into um, the terrible level of, of um, infections that we have um, to believe that, that quarantining and closing borders is an effective mode of uh, stopping health uh, transmission. Um, and so, so, you know, I think that we as Asian Americans and we as 
queer Asian Americans have a particular voice at this moment um, and a set of uh, a capacity to reveal the longer history um, of public health um, and how it gained its authority um, and what that should tell us. One of the things that's really fascinating about the story that Nayan Shah tells is that once public health as an apparatus was invented in the, in the 1880s through the 1900s, um, an event in San Francisco, this is, and invented to, pre to prevent the transmission of disease from Chinatown into other parts of San Francisco. And, and what they were able to do was, was obtain powers that were otherwise illegal by, the, by, by law and constitution. So they, in other words, they were able to obtain um, like almost the powers of a state of emergency. They could, uh, this was a period in the United States that had very laissez-faire capitalism. You couldn't tell anyone where they could have their businesses. You couldn't tell people um, uh, how to run those businesses for safety protocols and so on. But these public health people could do that. Um, and they could do it because they were telling people that they had to have these powers if they were going to stop racial contagion. So the powers that we have given to public health have come from um, the, the ideology of regulating Chinese contagion. What Nayan Shah discovers in his work and, and, and follows through is that once public health becomes a dominant apparatus, um, and it says that it has norms for what is a healthy society that everyone can participate in. It includes Chinese Americans and Asian Americans as one of the groups who, um, are, um, who, who can be described through these norms. So it's not a simple story of being excluded from public health. Um, it's also that Chinese Americans were later on included in public health but in a way that affirmed the, the, the scientific and medical norms of the health institution and not necessarily the history of Chinese people's relationship to um, capitalism and, and the various diseases of, of the city. So, so it tells us, I think, um, that we, we need to have a, an ongoing conversation about um, uh, health and authority, um, if we're to think differently about practices like social distancing. Are you and I respecting social distancing because we are receiving public health directives um, and we see those directives as so, not just scientifically sound, but as necessary for emergency times that we're doing it? Or is it that public health is, is, is developing certain kinds of knowledges that it has learned from the study of disease, sharing those knowledges, and then we are each taking it up for various reasons for our, our concerns for social welfare of others, right? Um, and, and how you take up social distancing is also part, and how you live it out is also part of a history that you're, you're, you're thinking through. Um, that doesn't mean that you disregard the authority of medical knowledges and science to tell you how uh, uh, viruses or um, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's a case of, of bacteria, as bacteria's work, um, uh, but rather it's that you're, you're taking that scientific knowledge and authority um, and thinking about how it, imp how it can be used in relationship to the community histories that you're a part of, right? Whereas too often what we're doing is thinking that if I'm an American, I'm going to follow the, 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 what Dr. Fauci and so on and so forth tell me um, and, and sort of passively obey the rules of social distancing, right? I think that one of the things that the, I know this sounds a little bit murky to you, so let me clarify it a little bit. One of the most important things that the, the movement against um, HIV and AIDS did was that it created, it forced, originally the doctors didn't want to do this and the public health officials didn't want to do this and the CDC didn't want to do it, but, but activists in the queer community, activists in the black community, activists in various impacted communities demanded that medicine and science be on their side demanded that those knowledges be distributed so that these different communities could use those knowledges for their own welfare. That's really different 
than practicing safe sex because you're an American citizen, right? So learning to wear condoms because um, you are following the authority of public health is really different than saying, I've learned that I can stop transmission between me and X person through this practice. And that has a long history of using knowledges for the survival of my community that has, hasn't had the, the state ever interested in my community survival. For example, if you're African American um, and queer. So, so it really matters how we relate to the knowledges um, that we're receiving from public health and from medicine if we're, if we're to think about how to use those knowledges and those apparatuses without becoming um, uh, sort of passive recipients of their authority, which also becomes an, a kind of loss of one's own histories. Um, and what we see, of course, with COVID-19 is that the people who are most vulnerable are people who have very, very complicated and, uh, histories with the U.S. state, who have been for a very long time excluded from the U.S. state um, and have only been um, uh, uh, poorly incorporated into the U.S. state um, and who um, for a very long time have been figured as disease itself by the U.S. state in the case of Latinos and the border. Um, and so we have to, we have, this is a moment that really demands that we learn how to relate to these authoritative bodies in a different way. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, that gives me a lot to think about. I have a lot more questions, but I do want to open it up um, to anyone who has questions that they want to ask. Um, Um, I think have a question if that's okay. I know we've also talked a bunch. <laughs> but um in the vein of no going away from public health. So I think that in the, the idea of public health is that you know we're trying to keep certain people alive. But I'm kind of wondering, Professor Reddy, if you have any thoughts on like necropolitics, I guess, and like are some people kind of worth more some are some populations worth more to society when they're dead and i think that's kind of a little bit what you touch upon in your book enacting violence against certain populations in order to protect other ones do you mm -hmm. see that or yeah how do you see that playing out with coronavirus especially because there is a lot of you know mainstream um news outlets covering Asian, racism against Asians, which is kind of unprecedented in my lifetime, at least. But yeah. it is, like you mentioned, an ongoing history of that. So do you see, you know, necropolitics and stuff like that playing a role in public health today or in the past? Can I add a little writer on to that question? Um, the other thing I'm thinking Because that about, wasn't hard enough already. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about the stock market. Um, because the news can't help but report on it constantly. Um, and I think one of the things I was thinking about is when, is like Ber Bernie Sanders, for example, his like big program is Medicare for All. And when Bernie Sanders dropped out of the race, the stock market had like a little bump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and especially health insurance stock. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. And I was wondering if that has any bearing on whatever your answer is all right so those are those are really hard questions um let's i'll i'll start with the beginning and then we'll we'll turn to financialization um uh next um but uh how many people know what necropolitics is or should i just quickly give a definition i think if you could give a little definition that'd be yeah okay so um so um, necropolitics is a, a term that was coined uh, by um, uh, Achille Mbembe, who's an African um, uh, intellectual. 
um, looking at um, the way that Western power systems operated, operate in Africa, um, including things like the nation state. What does the quote unquote nation state look like in Africa? All of a sudden it doesn't look like the nation state, it looks like a, um, uh, a, a mechanism to produce civil war in communities that are being forcibly put together by colonial relations. Um, so what 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 Mbembe was talking about was um, he was he was looking at Michel Foucault's work, who um, himself is thinking a lot about the politics of sexuality. Um, Foucault is the one who gives us the sense that what modernity um, strives for is a new form of power that governs people not through violence, uh, not through direct violence, like let's say uh, through uh, policing, um, but governs people by instituting norms across bodies and lives. So, so Foucault was interested in, in what he called not a repressive power, but a productive power, a power that was organized around telling people how to live, um, how to understand their bodies, how to think about their daily social practices, what the connection was between um, hygiene and morality, um, between um, a, a particular uh, way in which homes are built architecturally um, and um, a, a, a better uh, uh, gene pool that, that, could, that could emerge from it for reproducing uh, yourself uh, uh, across generations. So he was really interested in, in how things like public health, uh, things like uh, the invention of psychology um, or psychiatry, all these, the invention of medicine as a social project, not just even as a, um, a project to cure bodies, how all of them were participating in society all of a sudden by offering society norms by which one could live well. Um, and in fact, offering norms by which you could be your best human self. Um, and in fact, it was the broad transmission of those norms um, that Foucault says creates what he calls a biopolitics, a form of politics that's organized around these institutions like public health, um, uh, medicine, um, psychiatry, um, and a form of politics that is organized around um, ways to maximize uh, the, the national community's biological reserves. The, 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 to continue. So think about how we talk about, um, uh, we measure the, the welfare of societies globally by looking at their um, average age of uh, life expectancy, the, 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 the life expectancy span, um, or by, by negatively looking at morbidity mortality. So those kinds of things are biopolitics, a power that is in all of our lives as a productive power, not a repressive power. And, um, and Mbembe's innovation was to say that the ver those, all those institutions that were thinking about how to enhance life and that were governing us, not by telling us what we couldn't do, but by telling us how to do what we do best. That's the power, right? The biopower doesn't tell you what not to do. It tells you how to do what you're doing best and it explains to you what you're doing. So it explains to you what your sexual practice is, that, that that sexual practice connects to something deep interior to you that is your identity, for example. Those kinds of um, explanations, that's productive power. And what Mbembe was saying is, is saying is that the very institutions that were creating productive power were, and this goes back to Nayan Shah's work, also the institutions that were, that were saying that certain humans were a danger to the human race. Certain kinds of uh, human community were going to endanger the um, biological pool of the nation. Um, and so you would have to begin, for example, eugenics in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so, so that moment that, that medicine is on the one hand telling citizens how to live better, and on the other hand, sterilizing Latina women and Black women that second half is the necropolitical part of those institutions. The same power that, is, that is, is organized for enhancing life is also a power that can take other people's lives by declaring those lives less than human and even potentially dangerous for the human. 
So again, think about the coronavirus, the way that anti-Asian racism is being or organized a little bit is this idea that Chinese people, it's not that we dislike Chinese people, we just think Chinese people are bad for the biological life of the nation. So they should be excluded, right? But the second you also say that, you start to think that maybe they are not human the way that I am human. They are humans possessing a disease which makes them less than human, right? Um, so, I mean, there's even, anyway, we can go on and on about this, right? But that's what necropolitics is. And I do think that we're seeing necropolitics play out in the, the uh, coronavirus um, in all kinds of ways. Um, the, the public health people who um, were tracing coronavirus's arrival to the United States were testing elite communities because they knew that the coronavirus had to travel. And so what did they do? They tested uh, rich people who they thought were traveling for, for business or other reasons between these regions. Now, when rich people travel, one of the things about wealthy people is they don't cook their own food. They don't um, fill the gasoline in the airplane that they're taking. They don't work at the concession stand uh, that they're gonna buy their food at the, at the airport because um, airplane food is so terrible now, right? So uh, you have to go buy your McDonald's or whatever. And it was all in those kinds of transactions that the disease was being transmitted. Right, and, and there was no testing of racialized working class communities. And it wasn't just that they weren't testing it deliberately, it was that it never came to their mind to think that way. Public health just went to try to find the vector disease by thinking about who was flying, not what were the bodies that are also implicated in making the rich person have the kind of life that they have, right? So there's a kind of necropolitical shadow of people who are working and who are labor, but are not considered the human, but who are so invisibilized by people who are considered the human, even as those people who are considered the human rely upon them for their daily bread and welfare. And now it's those communities that are being hardest hit, the, the so-called not human communities, right? Um, and so, so we have to be um, cognizant of, of this, the, 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 the great power we have at this moment in, society, in, in modernity is the scientific knowledges, but with them, they are tied to histories of race and racism and histories of capitalism that oftentimes in their usage, turn out to have necropolitical effects. And so we have to be able to think both science and the histories of sexuality, gender, and race simultaneously. Um, oh, financialization. So, so I think that there's a couple of things with, with COVID-19 and financialization. Um, one is, you know, you just have to you you just have to stare in disbelief at the cynicism of um, the financial industry at this moment. You know, they they are spending their time every day betting on the value of a stock as it goes up and down, predicated upon the number of people who are dying or getting infected in a region and what the so-called curve is doing, whether it's flattening or not. And depending on all those different things, they're going and speculating to make money. Um, and um, if you look at the stock market, it's doing actually just fine. Even, you know, it's gone down, of course, but it's doing just fine. And the fact that that's, that's going on tells you something about the complexity of capitalism at this moment and how difficult, uh, what a difficult moment we're in, but also, um, how easy it could be to change this moment. And I do think that this was Bernie Sanders' point. Finance capital, um, Marx called finance capital fictitious capital. And one of the reasons he called it fictitious capital was because 
it's hard to know the source of finance capital's value, right? So when the values are going up and down, and for example, when the values are predicated upon securities that are themselves a huge number of mortgages that are bundled together and then spliced into bits, and then those bits are bundled together, and there's complicated algorithms that then give their value, you start to realize how much financial capital is a form of fictitious value. No one can track the value uh, uh, empirically. Um, one, we're in a moment of finance capital that's so complicated that not even the people who are creating these complicated uh, financial instruments are able to measure the value that they're creating. And that's partly what, uh, what produced the 2008 crisis. But one of the things that's um, brutal about this moment is that even while finance capital, unlike the capital that brings you food to your table, the capital that gives you housing or denies you housing, the capital that makes you hungry or gives you nutrition, that's all, that's all industrial capital and that has measurable value as opposed to a price. Now, the, the, with the case of finance capital, on the one hand, we don't know what its value is and its source of value because we don't know how to measure it. And then on top of that, it is so dominant and powerful that it is calling the shots in the other parts of our lives, even though it's not contributing to the other parts of our lives, right? So, so think about it this way. What we need in this historical moment is a reckoning. We need all kinds of reckonings. One is, how did we develop a form of advanced capitalism that was unprepared for this pandemic, um, but highly prepared to be running 25 wars across the planet at the same time, right? How did that happen? What, what produced a capitalism that is now so poorly adequate to the needs that we have, while it has a buildup of capacities for things that we don't need? Yeah. Um, and part of that is the history of how finance capital has interacted uh, uh, with uh, capitalism. Part of that is the history of how uh, U.S. empire has interacted with um, uh, capitalism. Um, uh, part of it is this, this biopolitical and necropolitical history we're talking about. Um, but, but I think that what coronavirus is revealing is really the failure of capitalism to provide the social good. Right, the promise that capitalism was better than other forms of economy and society because it better delivered what society needed and it expanded um, uh, welfare and it increased uh, livelihoods. Um, and you know, that's the sort of uh, oh, it's your, your guys' teacher, Pinker, it's the sort of you know, uh, Mr. Pinker's argument. Um, that, that idea, right, is, is truly in doubt at this moment where this market system is fundamentally incapable of protecting even doctors, right? Even doctors are dying uh, because this capitalism is so inadequate. So I think that we have a moment here to really interrogate the ideologies of capitalism. And I think a lot of people are ready to hear it. Um, it's almost like I wish Bernie's campaign happened after the coronavirus, because it would make all of his positions incontrovertible. Um, and it does. Let's make all these positions incontrovertible. One of the other things that is. I'm, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. I apologize. Um, The, the way that um, the monetary system is organized um, by, the, by the electronification of the, of the stock market. So, um, so, you know, there are two sort of significant histories to the to financialization of our contemporary period. The first is when you go off the gold standard and you create a, um, a, a balance of trade agreements um, to be able to keep currencies at its value. 
Um, and that happened long ago in the, the sort of Brenton Woods era of the uh, uh, Roosevelt era. Um, and then the second is a much later development in the 1970s of electronification of the currency markets. Um, and um, one of the things that's remarkable, of course, is that the, 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 the basis of financial value is all being um, circulated or routed through the dollar, right? And the, the US is now going to generate $4 trillion, right? That it's gonna to use to lubricate its, um, uh, its market to, to uh, so, so -called create so-called liquidity. Right, but what, what, what this is doing as well is it gives us an opening to say things like, wow, so you can just decide overnight that $2 trillion, the US economy is only like $20 trillion, right? So we're talking almost 10%. You can just decide that you can invent 10% of the value of the economy and throw it out into the world. But somehow, post-colonial nations who are debtor economies can't have their debt wiped out, right? So we're in a moment where we're really seeing that the financial instruments that we're living under and that have been told to be the laws of economics are not laws of economics. They are fictions backed by force, turned into the laws of economics. So. If we're to fight the coronavirus, right, we have to undo those kinds of inequalities uh, between, for example, structural adjustment and the lack of a healthcare institution in most of the global south. Um, and that, that history is one that we are all, as, as people who are US-based, implicated in. We are being advantaged by the effects of structural adjustment um, the fact that the dollar is even the, the structure of value, we are being advantaged by structural adjustment in ways that have made the Caribbean, Africa, parts of Asia, and Latin America absolutely destitute without even a healthcare infrastructure. So even as we're thinking about the coronavirus in our location, this should be a moment for us to think about what is the coronavirus in a place after structural adjustment has gone through it? Yeah, um, and, and I think that's, that's the conversation around um, the globe and around empire that we're not having around the coronavirus, that I think those of us who are Asian um, could, should be uh, promoting in, in the conversation. Um, hi, Professor uh, Reddy. I, I had a quick question, sort of not related to um, what we've been talking about so far, but I just saw that. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll preface this by saying that recently in my um, anthropology class, we, we talked about like professors um, and whether or not certain, certain professors like have the authority to teach certain subjects and like mm. what the line is and everything. Um, and how, and, and we watched this documentary, um, I think his name was Herskovitz and he was like, he studied a lot of, you know, black culture and, but he's a white man. And so mm -hmm. people were kind of talking about like, does he have the authority to teach this? Um, and then the documentary started talking about how certain Asian professors who want to teach American history, like people are doubting them. And I saw that you um, teach a lot about like gender studies and mm -hmm. women's and sexuality studies. And I was wondering if you've ever had to grapple with, um, you know, somebody telling you like, or asking you, oh, do you have the authority to teach something like this? Or mm -hmm. somebody like, um, just kind of your, your journey or any internal conflicts that you've had with that. Oh yeah, that's such a good question. Um... So when I, when I, I uh, for example, I, in gender studies, I teach a class on um, women of color uh, organizers and um, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, Ferguson Uprising onwards. Um, and what I do in the first day of the class is talk about um, why somebody who is Asian American um, would teach a course like this. And, um, and, and how who I am in part informs how I'm approaching the course. 
um, and how I hope students will um, contribute to the omissions that I produce based upon who I am. You know, so um, I, I think that the, the, the goal isn't to imagine that there's any one person in a room that is the comprehensive subject of knowledge for a particular question that's going on, but rather that there are people who know more and people who know less, people who know differently, um, and people who, um, so you know, when, you're, when you're a member of a subjugated community, you often possess knowledges that the university doesn't possess um, because the university uh, has excluded your knowledges in the construction of the system of knowledge. So there's all kinds of things that students uh, will, uh, students of color in those uh, situations will uh, contest and bring up, you know? So think about, you know, if you were a uh, black student in the, you know, 1950s and you were at Harvard and you're taking Patrick Moynihan's class and he's um, developing the culture of pathology thesis, you might raise your hand and say, that's not true at all, you know? Black men in my family don't care whether or not they're raised by single mothers, they love it. And it doesn't produce any less of a sense of masculinity or black manhood for them. And they would contest that and because they're the possessors of subjugated knowledge. It doesn't mean that that person in the classroom has the knowledges of how, for example, the political economy of the uh, society they were part of would operate because they've been denied those knowledges. So, so it would be useful for them to go to university to get those knowledges. So I think that, that my relationship to this question is always that um, it, one of the great things about the relational study of race and gender is that it's, it's always saying you have a positionality to, to, to articulate and to help you think through and share that positionality um, and see how other people share theirs and what kinds of knowledges can come from that. Um, so I don't try to teach that course as if I'm um, uh, uh, part of a community that is uh, subject to police violence um, in any way akin to way, the ways African Americans are. Um, I oftentimes teach that, that, that history um, or that, that story as one who has benefited um, even though I don't want to, from the uh, policing of African Americans because my immigrant parents' wealth has come from their home values going up because African Americans were kicked out of their neighborhood. Um, and all this language of immigrant success and how immigrants can um, you know, uh, jump uh, to wealth uh, quicker than Black people and, Asian, and Latinx people because they have better family values and they are more studious. Lies, 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 lies. What they were was oftentimes, I mean, and again, we're talking about certain Asian Americans, like South Asians. If you're Cambodian, you're like African Americans, you're being policed all the time and you're being put into jail. Um, but, but my, you know, parents' uh, wealth in part comes from the wealth of their primary asset, which is their home, whose wealth is coming from the policing of African American communities. So I have a role in revealing those mistruths in how I teach that class on Ferguson. Um, uh, and, and so being able to have that kind of dynamic, I think builds trust in the room. Um, I will say that, you know, one place where it's been really, really hard to teach is um, I, I, uh, when I taught my Ferguson class, I was also really interested, my book was on violence, and so I, my first book was on violence, and so I was really trying to think about um, how the question of violence was operating in the Ferguson period. And the other thing that was going on at the time of Ferguson was um, all of the really brave activism by um, uh, women on campuses to name campus sexual assault um, and to name campus rape and to demand accountability for campus rape. So, so I wanted to teach that material as well. And, and, and that's where, you know, being a bio boy, I just had significant limitations. You know, I really, um, uh, you know, I, I had to really, really rely, not just being a bio boy, but being a bio boy who's queer and not really identified with boys, I don't even understand heterosexuality or masculinity. So I was like, I can't even help you there to tell you what straight men think, you know? 
So, um, so that was a that was a a challenge. And what was really um, hard was knowing. So it's you know, hundred student class, and knowing if one in four women are sexually assaulted in college, that there are people in that classroom who've experienced sexual assault and you can't name it while you're teaching it. Um, they can if they want to, but, but I couldn't. Um, and, um, and they would come to office hours and tell me about it. Um, and that was a very, very complicated class to teach. I hope that that answers it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that definitely gives me a better um, understanding of, of these kinds of debates or discussions about, you know, who has the authority to teach certain subjects. Um, and that's always been something that I've been grappling with, too, um, especially because, you know, um, there are so many activists around me, there's so much activism going on, and then there are debates about, like, so who can say this and who can say that and who should be speaking up for this. And mm -hmm. so I've always just been... Um, kind of thinking about that and especially um in the past couple of weeks yeah yeah i mean i do think you know this is like the organizer in me um i i do think that there is real value in thinking about who should share a message on a particular issue um and i don't think you're doing it for reasons of identity i think that you do it to reveal how much we've been trained to hierarchically evaluate who's communicating so that we automatically grant more authority to white people who are talking about inequality than we do to the person who's experiencing the inequality, right? And, but if you make, if you then choose as a group to have the person who's experiencing the inequality um, give the uh, public statement or, or uh, produce a speech on the, on the movement, what they're also doing is revealing how much people are unwilling to make that subject the subject of knowledge. So they're calling out the contradiction, and that can be very valuable. Um, so there's, there are important tactical reasons to make decisions like that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I, I, I mean, one thing that I would say about that is this is why I think you have to always tie race and, and um, Marxism, you know, uh, race and the question of, of, of capital and power um, and value. Um, because, uh, you know, it's only by, by disassociating anti-racism from the critique of capitalism that somebody like him can look anti-racist, you know? Um, but if you had to always think race and capital together, um, at the minimum, he would have to talk about being advantaged by his anti-racism. Um, and what are the mechanisms that he's invested in for producing uh, social redistribution, for producing different, um, different uh, social policies that don't advantage um, in that way, um, you know, that undermine. So those are, those are the kinds of things that I think um, one, of the, one of the most important things is to always think race with capital um, and to always think racism with capitalism um, because it allows us to, to, um, to just quickly eviscerate those kinds of positions. Thank you. Maybe, I, do you have, do you think we have enough time for one more question? Possibly? Oh, I, I'm fine too. I'm enjoying you guys so much. We can do as long as you want. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, yeah Avik? Thank you so much, Professor Reddy. I'm learning a lot and this is giving me so much to think about. Um, I have two questions. One is returning to Sohan's point about culture and sort of the turn to the cultural and struggles for racial justice and like I'm thinking about that a lot also in the context of like even the naming of the cultural centers at Yale like Asian American Cultural Center as opposed yeah. to I don't know Asian American I don't know what the alternative would be but I guess that's my question like how has the shift to a, a sort of cultural framework as opposed to a political framework like made ethnic studies more palatable I guess to like multiculturalism within the university yeah what might 
we do to sort of counter that. Um, if there is a productive way of working from the cultural or yeah. doing it all together. Um, and my second question was more specific, like what is the particular role of like South Asians in producing mm. Asian American critique and queer Asian studies, Asian American studies? Um, mm. Yeah, those are so, those are such great questions. Um, uh, so the first is just to quickly say, absolutely, we can seize the cultural to do radical work and we should. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that, one of the ways that we do that, and I think this comes to the question about South Asians, is that the way that the cultural is organized um, in, the, in the US uh, Academy, and this is, uh, you have two teachers on your campus who are probably the smartest people on the planet who, who also write about this, which are Roderick Ferguson, who's in gender studies now, um, and wrote a, a beautiful book called um, uh, The Reorder of Things, where he's taking up this question um, that you just asked. And the other person um, is, of course, for Asian American studies is, is Lisa Lowe, um, who, who just uh, joined your faculty. Um, and so uh, I'm just gonna say stuff that they've already said. Um, but they have really, really amazing accounts of this. But one thing I'll just say for the, the conversation that we're having, um, you know, Rod's, Rod's critique is always about the attempt to turn race into a nationalism um, and the nationalist frameworks that people produce upon race to neutralize the real history of race and to neutralize race's um, more dynamic and transformative effects. So one of the ways that I think that we can use the cultural against the way that it is being positioned is that um, the, the, these centers, um, I was trying to think of the right word, these centers uh, uh, tend to think of Asian Americans as um, part of the American story, the national story, yeah? But um, if the nation was founded on producing the Asian as the other of the nation, then maybe we are not part of the national story. Maybe we are about the history of the nation, but not of it, and that we have other histories that we can also tell. So one of the things that we can do is, is take culture and, and write and think, and you all are doing this already in your theses and in all kinds of projects you're doing. Soham's doing it in his thesis. You know, write, about culture as the locus of imperial relations and not as the locus of how you connect to the story of America. Yeah, um, write about, so, so use culture to think about what histories of yours are not being taught in an English department, for example, um, and how you can call that culture, because that is culture, right? So like what texts are not being taught as Asian American is, um, Arundhati Roy's text being taught as Asian American, even though many Asian diasporic people who are Asian American, South Asian American, um, read her as one, right? So uh, not because they think she's American in any way, but she tells us something about the story of migrancy and empire. Um, and so, so, so that's one way, which is to really uh, use culture to disorganize how the disciplines have taught us to think about uh, the division of knowledge, how, how it's taught us to think about ourselves always within a national framework, yeah? Um, and I think the other thing to do, um, uh, again, this is my little capitalism pitch, uh, is to use culture also to talk about not, um, you know, the, the problem is people will say things like, uh, you know, my, uh, these communities are so resilient that they should be taught as like they had the kind of uh, cultural dispositions to survive the um, assault of racism or this, and the assault of capitalism. And maybe that's true, right? But it, that's too culturalist of, an, of, a, of a discourse for me. What I would be interested in is how do we, how do we actually name the class histories and the class processes that created what we understand as culture? So, you know, people who, for example, like Trisha Rose, who wrote a book on the beginning of hip hop and showed that it started in the Bronx in a period of deindustrialization, um, in, 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 and she could, she could actually identify why cardboard was used for dancing in hip hop 
um, how, how breakdancing was connected to deindustrialization, how the sounds of the beat were connected to um, the transit system. So, so that's what we want to do is reinfuse material histories into the rubric of culture too. Um, oh, South Asians. I think one of the great things about uh, South Asian studies, um, which is really true of like Korean studies or other things is, diasporic studies is really about connecting Asian studies with uh, US-based ethnic studies. Um, uh, and seeing how those connections, again, disrupt the national histories we're telling, um, but also uh, allow us to think about histories that are usually not uh, connected to who we are as South Asian Americans. So Soham and I were talking about, for example, work that he's doing on slavery um, from, and he's looking at British slavery in the West Indies. Um, and I was saying, you know, you could also look at the East India Company bringing slaves from South India to South Africa and think about how those processes did or didn't operate there. So diasporic studies can think a lot more about the global interconnections and help you think about uh, other uh, comparative touchstones that nationalism tends to make you not think about. Um, and so I think that that's what's sort of exciting about diasporic stuff, yeah. But there's a lot on South Asia history that we just don't know yet, that I'm excited will get written. Um, I know that we're kind of at the end of the allotted time. Um, I don't know if either you, Professor Reddy, if you had any like closing thoughts, um, but I think I, I would like to thank you. I think this has been so informative, probably has taught me more than the entire last semester that I've had, oh, um, especially on Zoom. Um, so I mean, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any closing thoughts or Elijah, if you have anything. I, I think, yeah, I've just been writing so much down in my little notes. <laughs> it's, it's been, yeah. That's so kind of you guys. Um, well, I'll just say that I'm so, I was saying this to Elijah, I'm so touched that you guys wanted to continue doing the event despite um, the context in which we had to do it. So I just wanted to thank you for taking your time and um, participating. Um, it, you know, I think you, uh, I've, I've told this to students who I, I've, I've been visiting all this year, and I just think you have a very special community and you all are doing really, really deep work and thinking really um, intensely and I, I just admire it. Um, and I think that, you know, one, one thing that I would say that I've been thinking about for myself is try to think about one thing that you might learn from this moment of um, COVID-19, from all the things you're observing and from social distancing, from living, you know, if people are living with their parents, going back to living with their parents, et cetera. Um, but just, you know, the, like one or two things that, that, it, that you've seen, that, a, that the, a contradiction has been revealed to you. Some, some way of being has been revealed as contradictory for the first time for you. Um, has, has been revealed as, um, as actually inadequate to what is being demanded or needed um, or what is, is good for welfare. And then try to imagine, I think when this moment is over, how to make sure that stays in the world. How to make sure that what you learned from the contradiction is, 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 out, is, is now gonna be part of where we will be going um, so that we don't return to the past because we have to create new traditions. Yeah, that sounds, that, that's, I think, really moving and makes me think a lot and gives us, I think, all something to chew on. Um, but yeah, I guess we might end off here. Um, but thank you again. Thank you so much to you. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, and thank you also to Elijah for organizing this event. It, I think, is so good. It was so, so good. Oh, uh, so, so touched. Why do hands look so big on Zoom? Like, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Anyway, thoughtful questions. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.